So, um, uh, hello everyone. My name is Martina again. Uh, I work in a startup based in Edinburgh called MOLZ. What we do is fashion, um, we, we work with fashion and we work in retail. And I'm going to lead you through how we're building a recommendation engine to recommend products meaningful to our customers. So a little bit about uh, the product and the context and why we're doing this in the first place. Uh, Moldy is a fashion mobile app application where you can swipe on clothes. So it, it's known as the Tinder for fashion because what you can do is you can, given, given an image, you can decide that you like it and you swipe right or you don't like it and you swipe left. Uh, we have shows, accessories, and all sorts of clothing from several different brands. So we collect, as the main source of data, these swipes, which are complex objects. Uh, what you can then do for the ones, the products you save, you can also buy them directly from the app itself. Um, hence, I also have all the orders data for our customers. Which, which then have the price attached to it, so how much the person spent. Uh, then there's all sorts of bits and pieces you can do. Uh, you can search for items through a full text uh, search. You can save your feeds. Suppose you are interested in blue jeans from certain brand. Um, but the important bit here is that you can set uh, certain brands to be your favorite by tapping on this star here. So in this image, you see this user has selected two favorite brands. And this is going to inform my recommender. We'll see how. Um, so the first challenge, which is actually the main one, is to come up with the right data if you want to build a recommendation algorithm. This is the image of one product, which is a print t-shirt from this brand here um, with this price in this color. So what we have against the product as metadata which we scrape from retailers' websites, is the brand, the type, which is identified by the, this icon here, uh, the gender, whether it's female or male, uh, and the color, which is again comes from this, uh, this other icon here, the price at which it's sold. Then we have a series of images coming again from the retailer website, and all uh, a, a full text, really, which uh, encompasses several bits I'm going to describe. So. What we do is we have a massive job of uh, scraping data out of, out, of re, uh, out of websites and format it to our standards by doing some classification, specifically on the type and on the color, because we have our own tags. Hence, we, need, we, we have had to train some classifiers for this job. And then we insert it into our databases. So print t-shirt, in this case, is the name of the product, and this is part of the text. Other big part of the text we have is the so-called description, which again comes from the website. And in several cases, not all but many, it's not meaningful at all. Like you can read here, this was describing this t-shirt here. The name is pretty informative, but the description is not. Uh, so you have something related to the length, the fit, the, the fabric, and then there's bits and pieces about how you're supposed to wash this item and what is the model height or something. Uh, so if you want to understand what the product is based solely on this description, you see that we have a problem here. This is not enough. Um, hence, what we do is we have a natural language processing simple job to extract what we call keywords out of the description. So the words which actually um, describe something against the product, which are meaningful. Uh, in this case, keywords for these will be print, t-shirt, which is a bigram, it's not a token, so like two words, and short sleeve, which is somewhere around here. Here we go. All the rest is rubbish. Uh, so we this furnishes the basis of our recommendation engine because we are only dealing at the moment with metadata and with text. We haven't touched on the images yet. That will be the next step. So the goal is to provide everyone with meaningful tailored to you recommendations so that you can open the app and say, oh, uh, these are the new products. Among those, these are the ones we think you might like. Why? Because mostly because people expect this feature. 
these days. So how does the algorithm work? And with some preliminary analysis. Um, first of all, we start from the brands we have. And what we do is we manually tag their styles across 14 features of styles, uh, which we tag with a rating with an integer ranging from zero, which means not at all, to three, which means it is very high in this style. Features are like active, which is, uh, does the brand sell active, wear up to which extent. Basic, if you have pretty much stuff for everyday life. Bohemian, if flowy dresses and skirts. Classic is stuff which is monochromatic and straight in shape. A dark, if the, if the brand, how much the brand favors dark uh, shades. Designer, those brands which, are, which come from a name of someone. Edgy, if it's a little bit, a little bit weird. A flamboyant, if it's very flashy. Graphic, if it encompasses some cultural items like writings or images usually t-shirts. Occasion is uh, if the, um, the brand sells uh, clothing for events. Sporty, it's usually holiday wear, loungewear, this, these sort of things. Trendy, if it's fashionable, usually appeals to the younger demographics. Urban is city life, and vintage is if it's a little old-fashioned. How we came up with this set of tags, which are just for teen, this has been through um, a brainstorming exercise across the, the company where we were just creating um, words for describing the all possible styles we can think we, can, we could have thought of and then extracting the ones which are emerging in terms of frequency. So again, we manually map the, uh, the styles for each brand because there is no way you can extract this information out of the description of a brand anywhere. And this is the correlation matrix of the, um, of the brands uh, across, of, of, sorry, of these features across the whole brand um, data set. So you see that some things like urban and trendy are pretty correlated to each other, which is not surprising, while maybe occasion and graphic are not, which again makes sense. And there's all sorts of bits and pieces. These ones, graphic and urban, are also relatively correlated. Um, we use this information to build the first feature in our recommendation algorithm. Another sanity check is to cluster the brands to see whether we have some patterns emerging, so brands which are actually similar to each other. Um, what we do is a k-means, of course, uh, by whereby you can derive the optimal number of clusters. Uh, has to be has to be eight. Uh, with this number, uh, so you see that it pretty much makes sense. Cluster zero would be brands which are designer. Then we have cluster two, which are brands um, mostly located around the active wear. Uh, here, me, we have edgy brands, mm, very, very um, specific things. We have probably something like the sporty slash trendy things. Here, guys who, who misguided this stuff are trendy. Uh, these ones are a bit designer, a bit edgy. So you, from the human point of view, it makes sense, it looks like. It's not perfect, but it's a okay means. How do we use this, all this stuff? Uh, so the first step will be going from the style profile of a brand to the style profile of a user in such a way that I can say for each of the users we have, how active, how basic, how trendy they are, and this will furnish our first feature. How do we do this? So B, let us call you the user and be the brand and I the index on the style feature, so from zero to 13, across the 14 styles. Let us grab the, um, the favorite brands of user U, call it, D, uh, call it A, and the set of known favorite brands, the ones he didn't tap upon. Uh, what we co compute is the ratio of saves the, the, um, the person has on each of these brands B. So how many items did it actually swipe right for that brand across the total is swiped for that brand. And then we have the manually mapped uh, style for 
uh, feature I on brand B. Orders, if the person has bought something, we factor this in as a swipe, and this is meant to boost somehow the counts for the ratios. And then we pass through the, um, for, from the, um, the style profile of brand B to the style profile of the person who has wiped in the app by doing cooking everything together in a big weighted average, which I couldn't write here because it was, it was too long, but I can give you the tales. Um, the idea then for doing this is to, coming up, to come up with the first feature uh, to feed the model with. So I can show you these are the ratios I have on several brands. The green bars are the number of saves the, the red bars are the number of hidden I have on this brand, so you can see that this is, this is me, this is my user. I swipe quite a lot on Esprit uh, and Tommy Elfiger, and I like them quite a lot. Uh, H&M, Levi's, I also like quite them quite a lot. Bear in mind that one of the challenges behind uh, all, this, all this data preprocessing is that it's very easy that people swipe left while finding something that you like is much more difficult. So people are picky and they make sense. So it's not the case that you have classes like uh, saved and hides which are balanced. They're not at all. Hence you need to, to build a model which makes sense with very unbalanced, with a very unbalanced situation. But given that thing and given the weighted average we use, uh, this will be my style profile. So this is me. It looks like I am pretty high in classic. I'm pretty high in occasion, but also basic. And I don't like edgy and flamboyant uh, or designer things. So a good recommender will have to capture this information and not show intuitively not show me uh, stuff which is around those areas of style. So the first feature we have out of the style profile, which is this distribution here, for a user is the um, similarity to a brand. So given yourself in your, uh, in your 14 dimensional space of style and given the, given the brand which lives again in the same 14 dimensional space, we just compute a cosine similarity which takes care of giving you a rating of how much you are matching that brand. The idea behind this is that um, we want to match users with brands, even if the user knows nothing about the brand. He may not, never have heard about this brand, and we want still to recommend him meaningful things. We don't want a rich gets richer process whereby, okay, you like H&M quite a lot because you swipe a lot on it, and we keep recommending you H&M. Because in fashion, it look, it, it, this is not a good idea. If I buy or like uh, skinny jeans from H&M, and I bought two, I maybe don't want to be recommended a third because I might not buy it simply because I don't need it. So we want to be robust in what we recommend you um, in terms of all the products we have, which are many. Um, now, this is the first feature we feed the algorithm with. Uh, the second feature will be um, the ratio you have on a type. So types are t-shirts, skirt, dresses, boots, heels, we have, I think, around 20 types. What we do is the same thing. So we calculate the ratio of saves you have on each of these types. And we do the same with the colors. We have, I think, probably 15 colors, which we, again, classify through a classifier for the product. Um, we calculate the ratio you have on black, ratio you have on brown, on white, so we can understand whether you prefer white over gray or something. And then, as I've shown you before, we have the keywords for each product. So we also know how much you save per each keyword. Keywords are attached to the type, so within jeans you will have one keyword, which might be skinny jeans, it's a big room. And we might uh, recognize that you like skinny jeans 46% of the time, say. Uh, so we use the ratio of saves as our main um, ingredient. Third step is actually to build the training sets for users. So we cram all this together. Given all the swipes that the user has created, we, insert, uh, we use the brand similarity, 
again, as a cosine similarity, the type saves ratio, the color saves ratio, and we compute an average of the ratios of the keywords for that product. Um, at the same time, this, this will be the training set for a user, given the swipes he has created. At the same time, because we want to recommend you novel things, so things which came into the app the previous week, what we do is compute the same features we will be uh, the ones to predict upon for the new products. And this is done on a per user basis. So as you can imagine, it's relatively expensive. Uh, we use a classifier, we use a random forest, we train it on the training sets of swipes per user, uh, and we apply it to the new products of the week so that it spits out a binary classification whereby we are able to recognize that you love this product or you won't like it. Uh, now, how do we validate this? Well, it's a little bit tricky. So on the good users, whatever that means, and what that means is that they swipe quite a lot, but they also swipe well in the sense that they give us enough data on each brand, enough data on each type, enough data on each keyword and color. There are these users, but there's also a bunch of users who either swipe just on one brand or they only search for jeans today and they open up the app three months later and they search for something else so that we don't have good data to start with. But on good users, the measure score done through cross-validation uh, is relatively high. But given a, uh, given a look at the confusion matrix, we see that it is fairly easy to recognize that you don't like something, so a hidden recognized, predict as a hidden. It is less easy to recognize that, that you like something. This is because of the unbalance, of the several biases we have in the data. So it is food for toth come up with a better, maybe a better way to, to compute the style profile, maybe different features we didn't think of. And in general, it is so much easier to predict that you don't like something than that you like something. On top of that, with those users which are bad, so don't, we don't have enough data in the first place, it is really fruitful to, to understand what to do. Maybe we might want to Instead of doing um, recommendations per user, we might want to do um, collaborative filtering approach and grab things like we are similar, so I recommend you stuff which comes from someone else's feed. Um, now, if you consider the style profile of users uh, and you, mm, you, um, you define <coughs> the, 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 the count, the, sorry, the ratios, as a probability distribution, what you can compute is the entropy of this distribution, and you will see that there is a nice envelope, which looks like almost Gaussian, but there's also some peaks. This is the peak of the so-called trendy users, the one which uh, favorite those brands which are in the trendy, trendy space. And this is, um, unfortunately, it's an inner and bias you can't do much about. Usually, fashion works in trends, and there are several brands which are popular and trendy. They only appeal to a certain youngish demographics, and they produce lots of products. While the edgy ones, the flamboyant, the designer ones are more niche, so it is more difficult to get enough data about them. This is in inherent to how fashion works. Um, this will be me across a test we did in the office, so we produced the actual feeds for ourselves, uh, with the weekly products uh, whose classification per user is a one, so it means it's, um, um, it's a yes, you like it. Uh, this will be myself, so we, what we did was a very sort of a high level validation of how, wh whether these things make sense in the first place and to see how many we could recognize in the feed as, oh, I would have actually saved this, so you were right. So it looks like it's, it is relatively good. But again, there are the limitations I have exposed. Uh, the main problem is how to scale this up, which is why, um, which is what we're working at, on, it, on, on at the moment, because we have 
um, good amount of a good number of users, uh, and we want to be uh, giving this recommendation to everyone. Again, very tailored to you. How do we do this? Uh, so we need to do um, a good compromise between time complexity and storage. And what we came up with was we build the training set for the large number of users and we add weekly to it with the news wipes you have produced during the last week. We cleverly try to manage the computation on the fly and the storage, so like we don't recompute uh, the ratios you have on the brand, on the type, on the color eh, every time, because this will be very expensive. But we keep track by, by relying on storage of the count, so that we just recompute the division, so that we add to the counts every week. And then we use PySpark. We use Spark, so it all comes down to transforming a uh, code which was running in a notebook in nice Python, nice Psyche Learn into SQL queries, pretty much. Um, and then we use Amazon Web Services. We rely on text files stored in S3 so that we can read them easy peasily with Spark. Uh, this is just a nice example, a nice couple of examples of how the code actually looks like. Uh, if you're familiar with Spy Spark, it has a SQL. SQL context, which enables you to, to, to use the SQL-like APIs. Uh, so we call the context. Uh, we write a load of uh, UDFs. For example, in this case, we want to um, co compute the numerator in the style profile for the user. Um, so we write lambda functions. And then everything becomes nice joins and selects, so the code is very long. Um, afterwards, after we have built the training set, we also have another PySpark job which does the, the actual recommendation. So for each of the users, we grab the training sets we have built previously, we uh, compute the features per user on the new set of products for the week, and then we cram it all in a pipeline for the model, so we index the status, which is save or hide, so that's the class. We assemble it uh, by selecting these four features I've described, and we call the, um, we call the actual model. Um, and we, we, we put everything together in a pipeline, we fit the model, and we actually run the prediction. Um, so that would be me. Thanks for listening. Thank you, Martina. So uh, you um, we ended up two minutes ahead of schedule. Perfect. So we've got um, 12 minutes for questions. Uh, we have already one question at the back. Um, remember to repeat the question in the microphone. Right. Um, please go ahead. Yeah, so I was expecting this question. <laughs> um, well, question. oh, sorry, the question was about um, why did I choose a, ra a random forest? So why did I choose a classification procedure, let's say? That's because, I've, as you have seen, we don't have the features beforehand. So like we have to do not only a feature extraction, which is transforming a text into numerical features, but also what I call a feature building. So I don't have the features of the product, I have to build them. So I have to go through this long process of coming up with the style profile and then brand similarity and then computing the ratios. So to me, it looked like the sort of traditional approach wouldn't work in this case. Hence, I transformed it all into a classification job of deciding, given the features uh, of the new products and given the ones you have for all your swipes, it just becomes a job of performing a binary classification. Specifically, why the random forest? Because um, out of several analysis, that was the algorithm which was performing better given the, the, the computation time allowed we could afford. 
Yeah, sorry, the question at the back was another question at the back that I had in mind, so please go ahead. Okay, so first question is about what's this weighted average, how is it computed in the first place, which I didn't show here. So this is just um, this is just an average which takes into account the ratio you have on a brand, the swipe, so you multiply this, this number by this number and you use a coefficient to make sure that if a user favorites lots of brands, it means that it's not very picky, it means that it's very loose, so you give them a score which is um, just a matter of how many brands he favorite out of them all and how many he didn't. So it's just a weighted average. I didn't show because it was, it was looking very ugly, really. But it's just a weighted average of these three ingredients. Uh, there's no random weights or something. It's just really, it's really computation. The second one is about why, wh wh what are we plan on doing about the trendy users, which might be a bit of a challenge, because it might be the case that there, if there's many of them, and you see there's many actually, because the peak is pretty high, whether we are thinking of doing something bespoke for them, training a random forest or whatever other classifiers with fine tuning uh, specifically on those. This is something uh, we haven't done yet, but we plan on doing, uh, and I don't know yet what what exactly to do and what cost function to maybe uh, describe. I have the feeling, the, the intuitive feeling that for how the model works um, at this very moment, it would be the case that these users might get this sort of very, very similar recommendations. And if we, it's a matter of understanding from the business point of view whether we want to uh, discriminate between them or we are happy with giving them sort of a very similar feed because at the end of the line, they are similar and they might respond to it um, quite satisfactorily. So it's a matter of understanding whether it's worth to differentiate. So we might want to do a, a clustering of the users as well and take different approaches based on how picked the distribution of a user is across the styles or how spread it is. Yes, we haven't, we haven't applied anything yet in this case, but yeah, it would be good. To investigate. Okay, so we have one question here in front. Okay, so the question is whether we, in the training sets, we consider all the history of swipes, and that the answer is yes because uh, we already don't, might not have enough data about, uh, web, about you swiping on a brand, on a type, on a color. So at this very stage, we consider all the ones, because the, more the, idea, the intuitive idea is the more you swipe, the better the ratios mm, become. Second question is whether we uh, factor in the seasonality. Uh, this is done through the fact that we don't recommend products ex considering the full stack of products we have. We only cr uh, get the weekly ones, the ones which came in through the last week, which are of the order of the thousands. So there's plenty already to choose from. And so we are sure that we are only recommending stuff which is really new. Otherwise, it doesn't make sense because it might be the case that this product is not produced anymore if it was from last year or so.
How do you, how do you mean embedding the in users in the space of the clusters? Which, which clusters? Yeah. Okay. Okay. Okay, thanks. So, oh, sorry, yeah. That was uh, the, um, the suggestion, more than a question, was about to um, make a better use of clustering products and users together. And it was about the new sort of method, a paper from Google, actually. How's it called again? Wasabi. Okay, so I'll, I'm going to have a look. Thank you. Yeah. So the question is whether I plan on using magic factorization, uh, which is one of those things you do when you're building a recommendation, usually traditionally. Th the reason why I didn't do this is that the matrix, you have tons of users and you have even ma many more products. You have many more products than users. And the matrix will be not only very big, but also very, very sparse. So it will become really a computational challenge. I'm not sure it would really improve would be the right approach. Uh, but if we want to do a collaborative filtering, it might be the case that if we come up with a with a better matrix so that we pre-process the users by clustering them so that we can actually as have a, a, a smaller matrix, albeit um, sparse, that might make sense for a collaborative filtering approach, which is not the case of how the algorithm is working at this very moment. I, I don't know what the limit is, but you can imagine that m products are in the orders of the millions. Users depend on depend on how many you consider, but uh, you have a million of products and you have users who have only swiped onto 100 of them. And you have those who have, in the best case, they have swiped some 100,000 because they've been using the app for ever since. But there's no such a thing as a user who has wiped on a, on a consistent part of the product base. So. so we have one question here in the front, and then one in the back. So first, Yeah, that's what I was saying. Uh, we plan on doing, especially for the so-called bad users, the one which don't swipe them. Yeah. 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 I know. I know. But because we want to be exactly very, very tailored to you, because there's this problem that in fashion, you know, I don't want to give you. Right, yeah. Okay. So maybe you want to, to summarize again? Because uh, when people ask questions, they can't hear it. Sorry. Uh, so the question was about instead of training a random forest for a single user, which seems like a very uh, expensive pro procedure, and it is, uh, why don't you come up with, um, with a random forest train for every user at the, at the same time by cramming together all the features in one line. Yeah, definitely. It's all 
work we plan on doing. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. I think we should, uh, yes, give a warm hand to Martina for a great talk.